Adam gave you the format of what we're going to do today. Let me just say that this conversation depends on you. It depends on your participation, your insights, and your experience uh, in technology as it affects uh, our world today. Um, you can see up uh, on the screens uh, the names of the panelists. I just want to very quickly show you where they are so you can know where to look, where they're talking. And I would also say, as you decide to join this conversation, raise your hand. We'll get a mic runner to you. Stand up, tell us who you are, where you're from. Uh, and let's keep it to a question or a very salient comment so that we can keep the conversation moving. We have a lot to cover today. Uh, first of all, Elizabeth Banker from the um, Internet Association is down front with us right here. Diane Katz from Heritage is over there. Takedra Mawakana from uh, Waymo, where I can't even see you. There you are. Uh, Corinne McSherry from the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Corinne, where are you? Raise your hand so we can see you. Yes, there you are. Thank you. And Luigi Zingales from the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. Uh, as Adam said, we have a lot to talk about. I went to him yesterday and I said, I need two hours for this panel. He said, you've got one. And in fact, the clock is already running. I have to have you out of here by 12.30. Uh, we are going to talk about, in no particular order today, privacy and technology regulation, competition in the marketplace. We're going to talk about content moderation. If you heard Jonathan Greenblatt yesterday, you can uh, understand we can't not talk about abuse and hate speech and technology and regulation today. Uh, we'll talk about media and technology and what technology has done to the media industry in this country. Uh, and we'll also talk about political power as some of these uh, technology companies look to accrue it along with market size. Um, just for some place to start, let's put that first slide up. Just for some uh, place to start, uh, the folks at SurveyMonkey and Fortune have worked together the past couple of years to ask people what they think about certain uh, aspects and facets of technology. And as you can see up here, uh, the idea of personal privacy and technology being in crisis, not only is it up, it's well over a majority among the general population, and it is among brainstorm tech attendees this year, almost half of you, which I think is revelatory and actually says something, that technology professionals realize that it's a crisis. Let's go to that second slide, please, if we could. That said, and if you heard some of the conversations yesterday, the fear of technology overreach, sorry, regulatory overreach is real. Uh, amongst those in this room, certainly. Maybe not so much, though, uh, with folks out in the general population. So with that as background, I think we could take that slide down now. With that as background, I'm going to change the question that we're asking in this session, with Adam Lashinsky's blessing, by the way. Uh, it's not how should technology be regulated. Uh, it's when it's going to be regulated. It's not should technology be regulated, rather. It's how and when because it's coming. If you've seen anything on Twitter or the news feeds this morning, you know that Sherrod Brown led his questioning of Mr. Marcus from Facebook and Libra by saying Facebook is dangerous. So it's a coming. Let me start with Elizabeth Banker from the uh, Internet Association. I'll ask you to stand, obviously, and uh, test my premise here. Is this the right conversation to have? Not should, but when and how. No, absolutely. Um... The Internet Association represents internet companies from the smallest to the largest, and there's one thing that they all agree on is that there is an urgent need for federal privacy legislation. And the reason that we feel this way is that there is a lack of clear guardrails for companies to follow and for consumers to know and understand, and overall this impacts consumer trust in the products and services that the internet industry offers, um, but it also impacts and creates business uncertainty and can impact innovation. Um, so we think right now is a great opportunity. There's a huge consensus across all types of industries, not just the internet industry, that now is really the time to do federal legislation. Diane Katz from Heritage, it's a coming, yes or no? I hope not. I mean, I'm not going to give in to the premise that you presented because I certainly am one that's going to continue to fight against the idea that there should be regulation, um, which is probably not a big surprise to, to most people who are familiar with, with heritage. But um, there are two principles that guide you know, my views about this. One is um, property rights. And uh, with very limited exception, I believe that privately owned platforms have the right to include and more probably more importantly exclude um, content um, or you know, interaction by, by um, users. And secondly, um, the, the second principle is that government regulation is 
never uh, the best remedy for complex uh, uh, social problems. Since the early 90s, I think that we've been engaged in a grand experiment with the internet. And um, it's completely outpaced the adaptive capacities of our social, political, and economic institutions. So it doesn't make a lot of sense to me that we now are talking about handing to them control for some of the issues that have arisen uh, during this grand experiment. Bureaucracies are ne neither impartial and they're not altruistic. And they tend to become handmaidens to gov corporate titans. So if you hate Facebook, the best thing you can do is lobby against regulation because the fact is Facebook would love regulation. Google would love regulation because it secures their dominant position. It creates hurdles to new entrants and it really um, undermines um, the evolution of the market. So Diane, let's hold it there with the competition thought, because I'm going to get to Luigi in a second. And I'll return to you on, on the, the merits of this case. I want to get, though, to Takeda Malkan. Waymo, subsidiary of Alphabet, yes. just recently, as we heard yesterday, got permission to operate uh, autonomous taxi cabs in California. Talk to me about regulation. It's coming. Do you want it or don't you? So I find myself somewhere between the first two responses. That's a good I think, place to be. Um, as a self-driving technology company, we were born 10 years ago. We wouldn't exist if this was a space that was regulated 10 years ago. The reality is the innovation is born where there's a lack of heavy-handed regulation. That said, the automotive industry is deeply regulated, and so we actually straddle both. And because of that, we actually think it's really important to figure out how to engage in these conversations early and responsibly. Typically, a company like Waymo, Waymo spun out from Google and became its own company about two and a half years ago. And I was one of the first hires to navigate this area. That's new. That's new. 10 years ago, companies were like, I'm going to ignore DC as long as I can. Hmm. Five years ago, companies were like, I'm going to ignore DC as long as I can. So I think we're seeing this evolution in companies now wanting to figure out how to engage responsibly with regulators. And certainly, that's the case with Waymo. Corinne McSherry. Uh, Electronic Frontier Foundation, Civil Liberties Online, yay or nay? Regulations come and get used to it. Um, so regulations come and get used to it, that's for sure. But I think a couple caveats to that. I think it's really important to focus on what kind of regulation we're talking about. So I think we started talking about privacy, right? And, and I think that some kind of um, privacy rules are coming. In fact, they're already in place. There's a reason why the Internet Association and many other companies are suddenly excited about federal privacy rules. And that's because a few states have put in place state, strong state privacy rules. And folks are not happy about that. So suddenly, everyone is interested in federal regulation in a way that they never were before. Um, as people who've been working in this space for 20 years, I assure you, that's true. Um, so, so we, and I think privacy rules are actually important and long overdue and necessary. And I think if there's a federal law that's as good as the state laws, great, we'll see what happens. But I share um, with the Heritage Foundation and many, many others a deep concern about federal um, overreach and regulatory overreach. Federal regulators are often not particularly good at it. Um, and so we have a, a deep concern about that. And the other thing, um, that we need to be careful for, careful of is not trying to put in place rules that are sort of one size fits all. Because there are going to be many regulations that might make sense for Facebook or Google or for giants that are just going to stifle the next Facebook, the next Google, the next Waymo in its infancy. And that, I think, is the biggest uh, danger of all that we should be paying attention to in this space. Excellent, Corinne. Thank you. So let's, let's go to Lu Luigi Zingales from the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. Um, address those two points that, that Corinne and, and Diane Cass from Heritage made about competition in this marketplace and regulations effect. You write on this a lot about the, the effects of concentration in these big tech companies, the power and political oomph that they have. Go ahead. Absolutely. I think when we talk about uh, regulation, the question is uh, which regulation? Because some regulation can be pro-competitive. Uh, think about number portability of your cell phone. This is uh, not a choice of uh, the cell phone providers is something that was imposed by regulation, something that increased dramatically competition. And if you look around the world, places that have number portability have lower prices 
and at least as good quality. So it's a net benefit for consumers. So what we want is think about how can we increase competition in this sector, because even on privacy, competition can be a solution. There is a paper showing that uh, Facebook was actually caring a lot about privacy until it had to compete with uh, MySpace and uh, actually turn around when Google folded its uh, uh, social media attempt and they remained the only big social media. Then they started to have a very aggressive surveillance state. So competition is the key. And what are the measures to promote competition? For example, copying from the, the cell phone industry, having more portability or having facilitate the interoperability uh, among or between various social media is a way to promote competition and with it to promote uh, actually what I call self-regulation of the market where if you have an alternative, uh, uh, you are under pressure to produce a better condition for your consumers. So Diane, thank you very much, Luigi. Now, let's, I want to remind the crowd, if you've got something to say, raise your hand, we'll get a mic runner to you. This doesn't work without you. I mean, I can go with these five for another 45 minutes, but it's better with you all. Sir, wait for the mic runner to get over there, Mr. Lashinsky. Yes, hold on. You're already mic'd, pal. You don't even need a mic. Uh, but go ahead, I, I don't think they're ready. Yeah, okay. All right, so, so the rules are stand up, say where you work. Yeah, oh, I, I, my name is Adam Lashinsky, and go. I work at Fortune Magazine. Right. And I think this, and Krista, I'm gonna take your lead from last year. I think this meme that the that regulators are not able to regulate is bullshit. Wait, we and can curse here? <laughs> we are allowed to curse here. Oh man. Was, is that yeah, that's what you said, okay. right? Right. All right. And so I would like some of you who are who feel that way to to address that, please. So let's Diane Katz. Go ahead. You're wrong. <laughs> why? No, come why, on, why, Diane. Why, more, why, more. why? Why? <laughs> why? Stand up if okay, you can. So I understand you listen, got an we have we have decades worth of experience um, in what the consequences of regulation are. I'm not arguing that they can't regulate. Of course they can regulate. They regulate tons of things all the time. The question is, what are the consequences of that regulation and what are the costs of those regulations? And on balance, they're they're both negative compared to private action. And and my point here is that users, us, the public, um, because of the internet in particular, um, are much more powerful and effective as a force for change than government will ever be. And to impose a 20th century regulatory model on a 21st century market risks turning regulation into strictly a political exercise because there's no law undergirding it. One could say that what we need regulators to do is get their, here you go, is get their shit together for the 21st century market. Hold on, hold on. I'm, I'm going to come back to you in a minute, right? They need to get their shit together for the 21st century. So we had one of those conversations that you have when you do panel discussions beforehand. Uh, and uh, one of the participants, and I forget who it was, maybe Elizabeth, it was you. One second, I'll get to you in a minute. Maybe Elizabeth, it was you. That, that uh, we're expecting these private companies to be able to, in essence, regulate human nature. Do we think that's realistic? Elizabeth, what do you think? Well, I think um, understanding customers is a really important part of offering services online. And I think the, the work that Internet Association has done to try and understand where consumers are generally tells us that consumers are very happy with the services that they are getting. Um, and that they understand the value that has been created by these online services. Um, I, I think what I said in um, our, our pre-meet was that according to some of the research we've done going out to um, do small business crawls and, and other things, visiting other parts of the country besides California and DC, is that the people who are angry about the internet are the people who don't have it. And it's because they understand the value that these online services bring to their lives. Um, so I think um, a, what we would want is for regulators to really understand where the general public is in terms of their feeling about internet services and where regulation's appropriate and not. Excellent, thank you. Yes, ma'am, right there. Please stand up and tell us who you are. Uh, Carla Monteroso, CEO of Code2040. I mean, we're 
outsourcing American infrastructure to a bunch of private companies right now. And that doesn't necessarily mean that it's bad that they got there first, but American infrastructure definitely needs to catch up. And the fact of the matter is that for the big five, you have companies that have more power than nation states there. And we have our own legislative bodies not understand how to interact with that and come to hearings pre less prepared than they would for a hearing on China. So I just, I cannot wrap my brain around how we are going to look at that gap between our American infrastructure and say, well, then these private companies are going to, to make private decisions around American public policy. To could you take that one, would you, as the representative of private companies here in this okay. economy? Um, I think that's a really interesting point. And when the prior two comments were being made, the thought that I had is, you know, I think we have a model that hasn't worked, right? And it's innovate until someone decides that there has to be either regulation or legislation. And then let's fight about the guardrails. And the real question is, what's the value proposition to that third group, which are the users, in our case, the riders, and is the value proposition actually at the center of that regulatory debate or not? And I think that goes to the prior point that if it's simply a political maneuver, then no, right? That said, the question of whether uh, it's been outsourced, the sort of US infrastructure, I mean, it has been outsourced to companies, but that innovation wouldn't have happened with the government at the helm. And so one of the things that's most important now, representing Waymo, on you know, a self-driving technology company is we're nascent and we're doing all three of these. We're engaging with regulators at the federal, state, and internationally. We are engaging with consumers because the reality is they're the ones deciding that the status quo isn't good enough, right? 40,000 people dying on the roads every year. We're pretty immune to at 100 a day in the US. We're pretty immune to that issue. That's an actual value proposition that causes people to say, oh, if you can use my data to help me get from point A to point B, that isn't something my elected official can figure out without you, Waymo. And so we need all three. We need the experts. And we need experts to actually be humble. Um, I don't think being expert means you have all the answers. We certainly don't have all the answers. Um, at the same time, we need policymakers to recognize they're there to represent the constituents and the constituents define the value proposition. And right now, to me, what we're seeing is this reset. You know, 10 years ago, people thought social media was actually worth the value proposition. Now, maybe we've aged out of it, right? Maybe our tendencies have changed. Maybe we overshared, regrettably. Maybe you lost a job. But whatever it is, people have reevaluated the value proposition of that. And there isn't actually a way in the legislative process to get those voices back into the loop. Luigi, very quickly, and then we're going to the back of the room. Luigi, very quickly, go ahead. I'm concerned, like uh, Montosa is, about the power of these companies, the power to regulate. We're talking about earlier about cryptocurrency, and Facebook and Google unilaterally decided in 2018 not to uh, add cryptocurrencies. By controlling a large share of the market, they basically run out the possibility of advertising. We outsource regulation to private entity. And I'm surprised because that Diane, if she had observed this done by the Chinese government, would say that's terrible, we should actually fight it. The fact is done by a private company doesn't make it any better. Concentration of power is bad, whether it's in the government or in the private hands. We should fight against that. Diane, so we're gonna do this presidential debate style. Since you were called out, you get a response, and then we're going to the back. I, I apologize. You really know Go what ahead. I would say. So, but what, what I will say is this. We need some context about this regulatory debate. When you talk about value proposition, there's two dynamics that are going on that are very important to understand to tell you what this, is, this, this debate, particularly in Washington, is really about. It's not about users. It's not about your benefit. This is about something I refer to as regulatory contagion. And the second one is uh, crisis opportunism. So Europe imposed an enormous um, regulatory regime. And that makes Congress feel inept. Where's their regulatory regime? And at the same time, you have companies like Google and Facebook that, don't, that want to harmonize globally their regulatory um, burden. So it makes sense that they want to get something similar here in the US. That's number one. Number two, 
Congress thrives on crisis. So if we're having a privacy crisis, if we're having a, a, a hate speech crisis, it gives them something to do. They don't want to cut taxes, and they don't want to cut spending. They'd rather address a crisis. So you have, even, you have conservatives who are, who are in crisis over you know, cons conservative discrimination, which is, you know, I'm not even going to go there. But We'll go there later. Don't worry about it. Go ahead. Okay. But the, the, the point I'm trying to make very quickly is that this isn't about user benefit. This is about power dynamics. And so to say that, you know, that it's private companies who are regulating, that's an oxymoron. It's just that you have private companies who are doing what's in their best interest. And to the extent that you regulate, that's when you have private companies actually driving regulation. Thank you, Diane. Question coming in the back. Yes, sir. Mm. Hi, I'm Roy Bahat from Bloomberg Beta and uh, VC. So I think on the one hand, comment and then a question, private companies have always made government policy the way that employee benefits work is the result of a private deal between the auto companies and the union. So let's not pretend that's new. On the other hand, like Adam, I'm really concerned about this thread of government is not up to the task. And just curiosity, show of hands, oh. this is my question. How many of you believe that government fundamentally cannot regulate so technology So wait, let me, let me take the moderator's privilege here. We all saw Orrin Hatch ask Mark Zuckerberg, how does your company make money? Yep. Zuckerberg said, uh, Senator, we sell ads. What are we to make of it yeah. when Congress demonstrably can't sure. answer the question? Totally agreed. And by the way, the next day, I hosted a political fundraiser at my house where somebody who had sold his company for $100 million was giving money to a political candidate. And the day after that, he emailed me and he said, when do I get my tax deduction letter for that political <laughs> contribution? <laughs> so as clueless right. as Congress is about right. tech, Tech right. is about government. Right, 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 right. And so let me just ask, though, I want to see how many of you here in this room, by show of hands, if you don't mind me just going one more second, Go how many of you by show of hand believe government is not up to the task? And so keep your hands up if you feel powerless to do something about that. Okay, well, that's good. Some of you feel like you can do something about that. Because my view is technology used to be an attacker industry where ignoring government was just what we did. It paid because they didn't quite get it, but now that we are arguably one of the most important, if not the most important industry in the world, this is a room of people who are leaders in the technology industry. The fact that Orrin Hatch is clueless is partially our fault. The caliber of people getting into government, being elected in government, being supported by people in this room, we can all do something about that, and we need to. Roy, thank you for that. Did you have a question or? or Show of hands. Oh, that was, was the question. Okay, what do you got? Great. Come on, as if that wasn't no, valuable. No, 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 no. sorry. <laughs> so, so, sorry. So, right, you next right here. Let's let's get a. Hang on. Let's get a microphone over here. Let's get a microphone over here, if we could. Over here, please, if we could. Terrific. Thank you. Stand up and tell us where you're from. Hi, I'm Carrie Tucker. I'm with uh, Pocket Watch. So we primarily work with the largest YouTube kid stars. So I'm curious if this changes the conversation as we talk about kids. So we obviously all want to protect kids and their fans, um, but we don't want regulation to come down arbitrarily based on some archaic FTC rules. So I'm curious if everyone in the room thinks differently as we think about protecting our kids. I'm going to throw that one straight to Corinne McSherry. OK. Um, am I? There we go. So first, I just need to respond really quickly or, or just flag something of that I'm noticing in this conversation. We keep talking about regulation as if it's just a matter of government doing something, right? But that's actually not how regulation works. Regulation, when I think about regulation, I think about rules. Rules are laws. Sometimes they're enforced by the FTC or the FCC or the SEC, and sometimes they're enforced by private actors going to court. I'm a lawyer, so I'm very in favor of that, um, but when necessary. I just want to really flag that because there's actually a lot of regulations that are enforced by private actors already in place that inhibit competition all in many, many ways, like the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. So I just want to raise that up in the conversation because that's actually really how regulation works. It's not just what DC does or attorneys general do. It's right. also what individual people can sue over or not. Okay, so that's important to, to focus on. I mean, with privacy in particular, I'd love to see a private right of action. So if you've got a privacy problem, you as, an, as a user can do something about it as opposed to waiting 
for an attorney general to do it or the FTC or somebody else. The users are actually empowered um, to enforce their own rights. So back to the issue of, of kids. Um, so I do think that it is actually really important um, to, and it goes back to the one size fits all situation. We can think about, um, do we wanna think about privacy differently when it's kids? And actually we already do, and that's well enshrined in our laws, and I think appropriately so. Um, and it's actually a little bit unfortunate because some of the large tech companies, I think, do not respect children's privacy nearly enough. And it is a concern because we have kids going online, using all kinds of services, and not um, very well trained or understanding how to protect their own privacy. And unfortunately, um, the companies that are collecting information about them um, are not protecting their privacy either. So I actually think that's a particular point, especially when we talk about privacy, where we should be really paying a lot of attention, and I don't think that we are. Thank you, Corinne. Let's go uh, over here, actually, to this question. Uh, Nathan, Rosen Nathan Rosenberg from Insignium. Um, I just want to follow up on one of Diane's points, but from a different view uh, in response to uh, bullshit. Um, <laughs> uh, it really feels It does. You know, right? Fritz Perl said there's horseshit, chicken shit, and bullshit. So it's not swearing, it's technical terms. Um, <clears throat> the, Diane, the other side of that is that Congress gives away, abdicates its legislative uh, role, and gives it to executive branch uh, um, agencies, and then says to them, you write the rules. Uh, which is not how the Constitution says the, the country should work. And then those agencies are populated from people from those companies that they're looking to regulate. It becomes a revolving door. I, I just looked on Google. The, the companies we're talking about are amongst the biggest spenders in lo on lobbying in Washington. Why? Because they have the most stake in how, how their industry gets regulated. So, and because you know, one of my, uh, when I was young, I was a congressional staffer who didn't know a hell of a lot, and industry folks would come in and, and talk to me, and they became my source of knowledge, and the same thing happens in the, in the federal agencies. So I think in the short term, it may be a good solution. I think in the long term, it ends up anti-competitive. So let's pick up on that, actually, and, and talk uh, about ant uh, competition and antitrust and the possibility of breaking up some of these big technology companies, because as you know, that's becoming an issue uh, in the presidential campaign. Uh, and I guess, Luigi, I'll go with you uh, and ask you, uh, spitball it for me. What do you think the reality is of these companies being broken up? The political reality or the economic reality? I think the political reality is, is gonna be difficult to do it. Okay. Um, the economic is, uh, is relatively easy to break up Facebook uh, and WhatsApp and Instagram. It's not obvious what the consequences are. In, in, that's the reason why I think interoperability is important, because if we are in a market in which we have a winner takes all, mm -hmm. uh, breaking up Facebook uh, from Instagram and WhatsApp is only gonna create a temporary war that it will create temporary benefits. Eventually, there will be one of the three emerging. So unless we break uh, the network externality that generates this uh, uh, tendency to winner takes all, I think break up alone will not fix it. Now, there are plenty of, of justification to break up Facebook because they lie, at least to the European Commission, about how much they will integrate, mm -hmm. and they lie and they kept confidential about the fact that uh, actually they had the intention to take over Instagram because it was a competitor. So I think that from a uh, legal point of view and justification point of view, there is a plenty of, of opportunities to break them up. The question is, what are the, the consequences? When it comes to Google, it's more complicated. It's uh, relatively easy to break up Google from uh, YouTube, but are you gonna break up the search engine from A to L and M to Z? <laughs> uh, it's not gonna work. So I think that that is where we need to come up with uh, new ideas. And, and one last thing on, on the ability of, of uh, the government to regulate. I think part of the secret is, and I know I'm not gonna be very popular here, but 
we need to pay more people that actually uh, are advising the government. And we need to have competent people. If we want government to be able to regulate, we need to have competent people. Unfortunately, we rely on the revolving door policy. Mm -hmm. And so the result is that uh, the only thing that they hear is what the industry wants to do. And so the they regulation becomes completely captured and uh, becomes in favor of the big players, the Facebook and Google, and will prevent new entry. Uh, I think we need to have more competent uh, advisors to the le legislators in order to have uh, some regulation that promotes competition instead of killing competition. Round of applause for more competent advisors, yes? <laughs> All right, good. Um, so, so, Diane, I'm, I'm going to go to you, and I'm going to frame it this way, right? Uh, Mark Zuckerberg uh, controls information that flows to 2 billion people. He wants to start his own money supply. <laughs> Why should we not sit him down and say, Mr. Zuckerberg, I'm sorry, this is not okay? Okay, we're a country of laws, not of popularity contests. And I think what, what you just said, it, you know, encapsulates the very danger of this sort of, you know, rush to, to um, you know, break up companies and so on. Just because a company may or may not have lied to the European Union doesn't give the U.S. any legal authority to break it up. It's an American That's company. Sort of city. It's an American company. Not, but whatever, what, if they lie to American regulators, there's already um, sanctions for doing so. But, but something has to be understood here. Our antitrust regime does not account for the, the dynamics that are occurring in the um, technology sphere. That is, A, free services, and B, the constant churn and evolution of technology. And so we're trying to impose on it some um, you know, 20th century antitrust regime that has nothing to do with what these markets are. We saw this in the Qualcomm case. We've seen it in other cases where the, the government regulators make up, essentially, a market definition that has no corollary to, to, um, to reality just to get their point across. And then they, they end up with, with um, you know, trying to impose law that's not even on the books. Sir. Um, yeah, my question, I think, my name is Chris Tolles. I'm the CEO of Topics. And uh, I see the industry concentration being the main focus of of the problems that we're seeing. Like if these com companies were not as huge, a lot of the issues would not be as, not be as big. Um, and yet, when we look to internationally, if you break up Facebook or break up Google or regulate these, these companies so that Facebook does not create the dominant cryptocurrency on the planet and enthrall us all, well, aren't the Chinese gonna do it? I mean, where, where do we deal with, these are national treasures in some ways, and the European Union getting hot under the collar? Well, good. What are we going to do about these things as it comes down to it comes down the pike? To we've created multinational corporate or we've created corporations that have become world you know world leaders in their areas. And I guess what I don't hear anybody talking about is if we take our companies down, won't someone else fill the vacuum? And I'd rather if we're going to have huge companies that are overpowering that they be American companies. But what, so what are we going to do to make sure that uh, that other people don't fill the gap? Luigi, very quickly. So I think that uh, Diane and also the, the person who just spoke okay. fell uh, into the trap thinking that uh, uh, antitrust and uh, competition will reduce innovation. Uh, history tells us is exactly the opposite. The reason why we are here celebrating the successes of Google and Facebook is because the antitrust went and after Microsoft. Microsoft had a plan to charge for every transaction on the internet. If it wasn't for that antitrust, Microsoft will dominate and Google and Facebook will not exist. Now, ironically, Microsoft is a creation against of the antitrust. Why? Because the antitrust went after IBM for 20 years. If it wasn't for the fact the antitrust was monitoring uh, uh, IBM, Microsoft will never have existed. The PC revolution will never have occurred. And then you can keep going. The reason why from the transistor we got the, the Silicon Valley is why? Because the antitrust went after AT&T, who controlled the transistor, forced the license of the transistor, created the Silicon Valley. So the antitrust competition favors innovation. And if you embrace the national champion view of France, you're going to have the level of innovation of France. Nothing like passion with antitrust law, huh? <laughs> How about that?
Agree or disagree, he sold it. Takedra, Te uh, please go ahead. Yeah, so I love your definition of a celebration of uh, Facebook and Google. Um, so to me, what your comments point out is the companies that were pursued are the companies we're not talking about. And we're not talking about them for the value that they've brought over the last 10 years or the burdens that they're bringing right now in the regulatory debate. So I think that's important. There is something that gets lost in translation. Um, I also really appreciate the international point, and that's what I wanted to say, zooming out a bit. I mean, the AV technology space is a space race, right? I mean, China and other governments around the world don't have the three tiers of government. There isn't going to be this robust negotiation. There's not a call to regulate the innovators out of existence. And so at the end of the day, let's just everyone take a deep breath and imagine a world where regulation existed, let's say, 20 years ago, and all of these national treasures, as they were just designated, didn't exist. And so what we'd have, the auto industry would be sort of the American export to the world, and we would be very beholden to, I don't know, Baidu and Tencent and all of the innovations that are coming out. All of these platforms that we enjoy would be coming to us under someone else's norms. And so I just think it's really important for us, especially, I mean, we think about this a lot because getting uh, the approvals needed in the US to do international cooperation is very burdensome compared to government sanctioned deals, right, if you're in China. And so think about this as a space race and then ask yourself, and it goes to the bullshit question, would your answer be the same? Would your answer be the same if you zoomed out and said, oh, global competitiveness, actually at home advantage and jobs, innovation in my backyard is important to me versus if we have this conversation as if we just live on an island called the United States. Excellent. All right. So we're going to, Takedra talked about taking a deep breath. I want to change, change the topic here for a minute. Uh, and we kind of do need to take a deep breath because I want to talk about what Jonathan Greenblatt spoke about yesterday uh, from the ADL about abuse and hate speech online and technology's role in it with a nod to Diane Katz pointing out that these are private companies. Um, what, let's start very generically first. And Elizabeth Banker, I'm going to go to you uh, at the Internet Association. What do you believe the role is of not regulators, but technology companies, private institutions, uh, in, in regulating abusive and hate speech online? So I think, um, speaking for all of our member companies, they definitely recognize the importance of being responsible actors. And the safety of individual users is extraordinarily important, and that's why having the ability to have unique community standards that prohibit things like hate speech, threats, extremism, all of these things are extremely important, as well as the ability to use the tools that they have to be able to enforce those policies. And I think what we have going on right now in the United States in particular is a debate that is focused on things like this idea of conservative bias, which is targeting the, the legal protection that actually allows the companies to remove bad actors from their platforms. And I think it's really critically important that as we talk about particularly regulating speech in the United States, which is an extremely complicated topic because of our First Amendment, that we remember that some of the legal tools that are being kind of singled out to be talked about are the ones that in fact allow the companies to take actions to increase safety online. Corinne McSherry from the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Go ahead. Um, so I think actually the debate that we're seeing right now around content moderation is um, largely a, a whole lot of magical thinking on, hmm. on behalf of a lot of people. Hmm. Um, I think that the idea that even large companies like Facebook with millions of dollars to invest is going to be able to come up with the perfect AI or the perfect AI plus human combo to be able to excise all the bad speech and only leave the good stuff um, is just not based in reality. They've actually been trying to do this for about a decade. Many of the companies have been trying to enforce community standards for about a decade, and they do it badly. They do it badly all the time. They take down all kinds of legitimate journalistic content, political content, all kinds of legitimate expression. They can't tell the difference between a racist comment 
and calling out a racist comment. Um, so the idea that we should be um, asking them to double down when they're already doing it badly seems to me to be you know, profoundly misguided. And the other thing, a little bit more fundamentally that I worry about is getting back to this idea where we have these you know, few tech giants. The idea that we should say, please, Mark Zuckerberg, police speech for the rest of us. We'd really like you to do that better. You know, the idea we're going to look to Silicon Valley to make decisions about speech for the United States and around the world seems to me profoundly, profoundly dangerous. And it does take us back, to my mind, to the sort of issue around competition. What I want is not for Facebook to be in the driver's seat. I want me, as a user, to be in the driver's seat, making decisions about my internet experience. And I'm only going to get that if I have choices. And if I don't have to just rely on Facebook to talk to my friends and communicate with my friends, if I have lots of different social media services that I can speak to, and the only way that I'm going to get that is if there's more interoperability, adversarial interoperability in particular. I want add-on innovation. I want Facebook to have to let other people um, build on its platform so that I can, again, control my own internet experience as opposed to looking to Silicon Valley to do it for me. So I'm going to go to Diane Katz really quickly and then to the back. And Diane, I'm going to frame it for you this way. Um, with the acknowledgment that there's no First Amendment right to a Twitter account, but that, as Jonathan Greenblatt said yesterday, uh, some very high-profile hate speech is coming from the President of the United States on a private platform, what are we to do? I don't know what hate speech is, to tell you the truth. I mean, I would ask everybody in this room to define what hate speech is. Well, and hold on, hold on. Let me let me, finish. Let me, let are me you do it. Are you going to interrupt my speech? Let, let, gonna, let, gonna... let me do it. Let's not use the phrase hate speech. Let's say racist. Then what? Then what? What? I mean, can we allow then racist? What we, then what do we do? Speech on Twitter. What do we do? If you don't like the speech on Twitter, don't go on Twitter. And if you don't like the president running his mouth on Twitter, don't go to Twitter. It's that simple. Look, hold, The United hold States it. has a, yep. a long history of freedom of speech, and it's integral to our very DNA as a country. And we also have a number of, of experiments in trying to have government regulate speech for fairness, and they, they turned out dismally. And so the, the idea that somehow uh, the FTC is going to be able to, um, as currently is being proposed, um, you know, certify neutrality in speech. It's, la it's laughable. And it really takes away from where the responsibility should lie, which is the platforms themselves. Because if they want to be known among their customers as the hate speech mongers, that's the risk they're going to take. Or if they want to appear to their customers or their users as being um, proactive against hate speech, then they're going to regulate it to the best of their abilities. Although I agree with you that you know there's a lot of wishful thinking about the extent to which they can do that. Look, I'm a conservative, and I think that all of these claims about you know conservative bias are silly and and go against the very you know fundamental principles of conservatism. If if, if we have a record where we've seen in the past where broadcast companies refuse to really offer conservative principles, you know, conservative viewpoints. Well, what did they do? They established their own. We have now have Fox and we have, you know, Rush Limbaugh and talk radio and lots of other sources of conservative commentary exactly because other broadcasters failed to provide it. So do we want that to happen or do we want a, a regime where there's very little viewpoint at all because we're trying to scrub it. Let me, let me take some very, very on point and brief comments. Luigi, hang on, on that, because there's a lot to say. I think that we're missing a fundamental point. Or, or go <laughs> ahead. <laughs> or, or go ahead. We are missing a fundamental point about the hate speech. That, uh, diffusion of hate speech by the platform is not a bug, is a feature. It's their business model. Right. In a sense, the, the algorithm are selected, why? In order to provoke you and to keep you attached to that smartphone as much as you can. The President of the United States has been very good for Twitter's business, yes or no? Yes. 
Okay, just check. Exactly. Absolutely, right. but and and Twitter if promotes what the president says in order to get more people to respond and to create more and more of this. And we all go, oh my God. Exactly. Right. So right. now, right. can we, can we, can we. I'm a journalist, I have to be. Can we board. go uh, out of it, like Diane says? Yes, in a world of competition, we could. But it's like saying, can you go out of the phone now in, in the 20th century, maybe in the 21st with a message you can, but in the 20th century, can you live without a phone? No. In fact, the phone was for a long part regulated and was forced interoperability. Otherwise, people are left out. So we need to have more competition. Otherwise, we're going to have these uh, companies uh, take over with their hate speech more and more. And, and I agree with Karine trying to give them the, 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 the thing to moderate themselves is like saying to a alcohol company to try to uh, reduce people drinking. It's not going to happen. All right. Very quickly, please. Yes, I've, I've got questions lined up. I just want to say, I, and I fell victim to this myself just three minutes ago. Um, it's really important that when we have this conversation about content moderation, we actually don't just focus on, on Facebook and Twitter, yep. because one thing is yep. Facebook and Twitter, well, not Twitter so much, but Facebook certainly has lots of money to invest in content moderation, and it's a social media platform. But there's lots and lots of different kinds, and everyone in this room knows this, lots of different kinds of companies and services that also host you know, comments, criticism, all kinds of user-generated content. So when we have this conversation, we need to make sure that we're thinking about regulation that might make sense for them, and not just regulation that makes sense for Facebook. Absolutely. One size does not fit all. So to your question, you've been very patient. Thank you, sir. Yeah, no problem. Uh, Wyatt from uh, Patreon. Oh. And uh, Patreon's a platform for creators, journalists, YouTubers, podcasters. Uh, and we compete directly with Facebook and YouTube and the big tech companies. Um, they've all built exactly what we do uh, to, a, to the pixel. And okay. we still feel like there's plenty of room uh, for a company like us to grow pretty quick for creators and artists who want to have um, an open, neutral platform that plays well with everybody. Um, but it is challenging. And, and it's challenging because there's no competition. I would love to believe if it was truly a free market that we could thrive. But the fact of the matter is, all of us have to search. We do need to search. That is a market, and they have a monopoly in that market. Um, and so that's the challenge for small companies like Patreon to fight against um, bigger tech incumbents like this. On the content moderation side, this is directly tied to the competition point, which is what you just pointed out. Um, for example, at Patreon, we do all of our content moderation um, personally. We don't have AI. We have people that reach out to content creators and actually talk to them about taking it down. If big tech companies had to deal with the messes they've made in that way. They had to have a human being deal with all of the people whose lives they affect when they take down their content. I think we would find that these businesses aren't as exciting and profitable as we thought when they grew. But when they grew, um, they grew on the concept of everybody come, everybody put up your content, and we'll just sort it out later. And that's created a moat in an anti-competitive environment that's not friendly to smaller companies. Any of the panelists want to weigh in on that one? No? OK. You've been very patient as well, sir. I apologize for making you wait. Go ahead. That's all right. Uh, Mark Mahaney with RBC. Geez, Louise, uh, Luigi, I, I kind of really strongly, respectfully disagree with your point. I think about the history of technology. And the reason that most of the most innovative technology companies in the world are in the US is largely because of light regulation. And it's been because of competition. Who aren't we talking about today? We're not talking about Yahoo, we're not talking about eBay, we're not talking about AOL. Those are the big tech monsters that if we'd had this conference 15 years ago that we'd have been talking about. And the reason we're not talking about them is they got out innovated. And the reason that Microsoft lost market share in a lot of major and missed mm -hmm. major market opportunities like cloud computing, that wasn't Microsoft, that was Amazon. We haven't even talked about them. So I'm more struck by the fact that competition is what, and light regulation has really allowed innovation to thrive in this country and has created great wealth opportunities, not just for the owners of the, those companies, but for a lot of employees too. These are now the biggest employees in this country. So anyway, I'm struck that regulation wasn't, antitrust wasn't what really uh, 
I want to be really careful that we don't overregulate over what's been a great growth engine for this country. They, there needs to be regulation, but the history, the reason that there's most innovation in this country than any other is that regulation has been light, not heavy. Can I We're going to go to the nice very quickly, I, but I, but I, still I, passionately. I agree. <laughs> I agree with you. You mix up regulation with antitrust. Antitrust is not regulation. You should be very aggressive with antitrust and light with regulation. So we agree. There we go. God, look at that. He did it. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Hi there. Uh, Sharon Waxman, um, oh, founder Sharon. of The Wrap. Hi. Luis, you have a lot of really interesting things to say. I think that we'd have an interesting conversation after this town hall. But I, I want to make a distinction between what you're pointing out in terms of monopolistic power of these massive communications platforms and regulating content and hate speech. So I don't agree that at all that we can't define hate speech. If we can't as a society define hate speech, then we're in a lot of trouble. And if we just turn, if we abdicate responsibility uh, over regulating hate speech, then, that's, that, then we're in the situation that we're in today. What we've started, uh, but that doesn't mean that the government should be regulating that. And on that point, I think that that's what, what we're talking about. I, my uh, company, a media company, covers Hollywood, right? This has been a big issue for Hollywood going all the way back to the 40s. How do you, should the government be regulating movies and television, which were the big forms of mass communication at that time? And the MPAA at the time fought very hard. Jack Valenny, the lobbyist who everybody knew for 40 years, fought very hard to make sure the government did not regulate, protected the rights of expression for artists and creators, but said the, this industry will regulate itself. The problem is the tech companies, Google and Facebook, have not accepted up until very recently, and I don't know that they do now, their responsibility as content platforms, as publishers. They see themselves, Mark Zuckerberg sees himself as a technologist, not as a content person. So the tension in there of not wanting to own the responsibility of what it means to have the largest communications platform in the world is where the rubber meets the road and why we're, de we're dealing with this. I think that, that raising that consciousness, and I write about it all the time, for Facebook and Twitter, and with respect, the smaller companies are not the ones that are driving hate speech. It matters when Alex Jones can say whatever he wants about the children who were killed in Sandy Hook to the world, that he can propagate um, conspiracy theories that are factually incorrect and demonstrably so, and be given a platform just because we believe in the First Amendment. That's the issue. The technology companies have to own their responsibility it, unless they want the government to step in and regulate. Elizabeth Banker, let me go to you from the Internet Association. Thank you. You, you knew I had to come to you on that. Right. Do you think your member companies get it? So now. I, I, you know, I think it's a, it's a complicated issue, and maybe starting off with um, a little bit of history. I've been doing this for about 25 years. Um, you know, I think the U.S., has this very strong First Amendment tradition yep. that um, many of the creators of um, tech companies, uh, both past and, and present, have wanted to embody in the services that they created. They wanted to be that voice for those people who didn't have voices, that didn't have access to the large media platforms. They wanted to give those voices out and do that in a way that respected and promoted the First Amendment. I think what we've seen is that um, obviously, much like in the offline world, when you give people that voice and that power, they will oftentimes use it for ill purposes. And so I think what, what has happened is that there has been an evolution. And I think you know, part of it is the companies have to change as the world around them changes. And I really do believe that they are engaged. And they're engaged with governments. They're working together with each other to tackle these issues. They're working with civil liberties groups and NGOs that work on hate issues. Um, and they're engaged with their users and trying to be responsive. So I, I do think they get it. So of course, now I've got three questions waiting. I've got seven minutes left, and I want to give the panelists a chance. So we're going to bang these out, and I probably won't get to all three, but right there, please. Quickly, if you would. Hi, my name is Will Obendorf, investor based in San Francisco. And I just feel like a lot of, or I've gotten the feeling that this talk has been centered around the assumption that regulation is going to help break up big companies. If you look at Dodd-Frank, though, 
if you look at GDPR in Europe, I mean, I've seen even reports that like small to medium sized ad revenues down 15 to 30 percent because none of those companies can keep up with all the regulation. Like, how do you guys think about regulation in terms of going too much where actually you're solidifying the market share of the incumbents? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Corinne, go ahead super quickly, please. And then I'm, yes. I'm afraid we're going to have to go straight to the wrap ups. OK, I have Sorry. lots of thoughts about that. And it was going to be my wrap up. So I'll just go ahead of things. Oh, I actually right. well, think it's really, really important that when we have conversations about regulations, that conversation should be just as much about the regulations we need to get rid of because they're stifling competition. The Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, DMCA 1201, I could go on. But that really should be part of the conversation. And really, it's the low hanging fruit. We've got a lot of outdated computer laws that you know are 30 years old, 20 years old, we could get rid of them and foster more competition. Um, we should do that before we're trying to get into antitrust reform, which is much, much more complicated. Elizabeth Banker, you want to wrap it up, please, your thoughts? Sure. Just to, to kind of summarize, I want to revisit a point that Corinne made that I think is really important. Much of our conversation today has been about a small handful of the Internet Association's member companies. We have over 40 members. They do all sorts of interesting things online and you know, from you know, autonomous vehicles, ride sharing, short term rentals, I'm, I'm not going to name them all. But these are companies that have been able to be created, exist and flourish in the United States thanks to the regulatory environment that we have. I think that if we're talking about regulating content, we get into very tricky issues where it is really hard to identify speech that should be removed versus speech that should be allowed. And um, I think review sites, we keep hearing from users that the ability to look at a rating of a driver of a ride sharing car, of a place they're looking to rent, um, a product they want to buy is really instrumental in their trust of those platforms. So I think really allowing user reviews and those types of content to continue to flourish is really important. Um, and then I would just uh, end by saying that I do think kind of regardless of the reason why right now is the best time to do privacy legislation, it is really important for consumers to have a single nationwide standard across all of the different sectors, states, um, online and offline situations where their personal information is used. They need consistent expectations and only a federal law at this point is going to give that. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Diane Katz, briefly, please, your final thoughts. Okay, first, I just want to thank Fortune for allowing me to be here. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you. Um, but second, I just want to say one thing about relative risk. Um, with the, um, you know, there's a lot of concern here about, you know, the public interest. Our, our greatest challenge, at least from my perspective right now, is the abysmal state of the government's IT infrastructure and that vis-a-vis -vis China um, and the advent of 5G is our greatest risk, not people's sentiments about speech online or, or, or privacy. Thank you. Then thank you. Takedra, please. Uh, so uh, what I'd like to say, someone who's been in the tech industry for almost 25 years, is it's dangerous to make assumption-based regulations. The reality is privacy legislation, we're talking about it as a current crisis. We've been trying to pass privacy legislation the last 20 years. It's not, it's not new. We haven't been able to do it because we haven't been able to define the harm. And if we would have done it 20 years ago, and by we, I just mean the US with industry, it wouldn't have fit what we've now seen as the state of play. And so assumption-based regulation is what I sort of inherited when I joined Waymo. I met with policymakers, and they would tell me what was happening at self-driving technology companies, what they were doing and what they were up to. And the reality is we were the only company that had been up to it for almost 10 years. And those conversations weren't happening. And so I think the more that experts can sort of get themselves across the country and spend time with policymakers, staffers, making them smart, being humble about it, because it's very intimidating. It is very intimidating to have an ML or AI expert walk in and start 
talking above your head um, and you're like trying to be smart for your boss. And so, and to stay in touch with communities because the reality is that if people don't use this technology at the end of the day, the value proposition will be lost. And I'm going to keep coming back to value proposition because while there may be theatrics happening in DC, the value proposition eroding is why people will start voting with their feet saying they want the regulation. Takidra, thank you. Corinne, you're good, right? I'm good. Okay. Luigi, you have literally 45 seconds. Okay. Um, one topic would not discuss data. I think that uh, Takindra is right when she says that uh, we should not do assumption-based regulation. In order to regulate or not regulate, we need to understand. In order to understand, we need access to the data. Unfortunately, the platforms allow only who they want to have access to the data. So we don't know exactly how, for example, the auctions of uh, uh, advertising at Google and Facebook are running, are really run. We don't know the track record of uh, the driver of Uber or Lyft, since you want to talk about the other member of the association, Elizabeth. And these data are potentially shareable under pr a privacy concern with researchers that can be really independent, not picked, but independent. And uh, I am actually proposing the following rule that I call the Sherlock Holmes rules, that whenever there is a potential answer, and uh, this answer is not, that is against, uh, you can test whether this is in favor or against uh, the, 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 the owner of the data, and they don't show with the data the answer is in their favor, means that they have tried and is against them. Is their idea that if the dog doesn't bark, it means that the dog was not there. I got a dog Thanks. barking in my ear my right, right now <laughs> telling me to get you guys out of here. We are over time. Thank you so much for your time this afternoon, and thank you to the panelists.